The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'll tell you where we are. Uh, give you a sense of what's going to come in the rest of the course. So, forget the stuff inside. In the beginning, in my video, I explained to you that the field of dynamics consists of three things. I kind of didn't tell you about this, all right, but I'll tell you about it now. Kinematics, which is motion, pure geometry, no forces, nothing, nada, pure motion, which is what we've been concentrating on for the last uh, couple of weeks, all right? Kinetics. Kinetics is actually motion, right? Kinetic. Um, in chem any, any chemical engineers here? Probably not, but in, yeah? Chemical kinetics, right? It means dynamics, when stuff happens, okay? Motion. Kinematics is more like geometry. Yeah, like you can take care of motion, but it's not, there are no forces involved. Then finally, the thing I left out, which is constitutive relationships. How many of you are taking 2001? You've heard the term, I'm sure, constitutive relationship. Anyone, can, can anyone tell me what it means? Anybody? It relates kinematic to kinetic? Not real. Well, yeah, you could uh, tell me in the context of 2001, then I'll, I'll, you're probably right. So, constitutive relationships, let's see, 2001 is like, uh, uh, like F equals KX. Relationships That's right. Constant. That's right. What are the other kinetic, uh, constitutive relationships? Anyone back there? In 2001, that's right, F is equal to KX. What's the equivalent in 2001? Loudly? You're right. Yeah, yeah, basically stiffness, all that stuff. Gravity, by the way, right? So, so you're right. So constitutive relationship is stuff like F is equal to KX, okay? Or gravity, right? Now here's the deal. Kinematics just deals with finding X and X dot and x double dot, right? Position, velocity, acceleration. That's what we did. Spider on a frisbee, how much does it accelerate? Um, what's its velocity, right? This is kin kinematics. Constitutive relationships build these models, OK? F is equal to kx. It's not really true, but it's, I know my BlackBerry's going off here. Um, but it's kind, it, you know, it's a good approximation. It's a model. Gravity is, is correct. In non-relativistic situations, gravity is also a good model. So those are constitutive relationships. They come from experiments and so on, right? And kinetics deals with a particularly important form of the constitutive relationship, also called, sorry, a particularly important example of constitutive relationships, also referred to as, yeah, Newton's laws, right? So if you say F is equal to MA, force is equal to mass times acceleration. The acceleration comes from kinematics. Mass is actually also kind of related to kinematics, but we'll do it in a different context later, right? But force, you know, comes from, the const some, from either contact or from, you know, you're stretching a spring or gravity or something. And when you relate the two, it's kinetics, okay? Now, the way we did this course, the way we've traversed this space is you have kinetics, so the kinematics, kinetics, constitutive relationships. I won't be too explicit about this, all right? When you do electromagnetics, for example, you will learn one particular, and you've, you've already seen it in physics, source of constitutive relationships, the Maxwell's laws, right? When you do 2001, you see another source, spring, stiffness, stuff like that, okay? Uh, when you do fluid mechanics, you will see another source, which is viscosity and gravity, okay? When you do thermodynamics, you'll see another source, which is pressure. You know, there, I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, that's where the kind of the religious stuff comes in. This is all secular. It doesn't matter which field you're in. This is correct, okay? Um, this, now, so kinematic, kinematics, kinetics, constitutive relationships. Now, the, the way the course proceeds usually is you have particles. Then we look at systems, systems of particles. How many degrees of freedom does a particle have in two-dimensional space these days? 
two. Yeah. In three-dimensional space, how many degrees of freedom does a rigid body have in two-dimensional space? In two-dimensional space, three. And in three-dimensional space, six. Can you name them in three-dimensional space for a rigid body? What are they called? Any names? Ankit? Translation. Yeah, so translation and X, Y, Z. And what are the rotation? Any, do you have do you remember names of the rotations? They're different categorizations. Levi. Roll, pitch, and yaw. Roll, pitch, and yaw. That's one way to look at it. Right? So six degrees of freedom. OK. Now, so particles, systems of particles. Can you give me an example of a system of particles that's not rigid? Yeah, a fluid. Yeah, a human body contains fluids, and it's not rigid, right? Um, rigid bodies are things which we assume there's no motion relative, OK? So this course, our course, has to do with mostly particles. We'll do a little bit of systems of particles, but I don't find that particularly exciting. Besides, you have intact courses on this, like 2001, where particles move, but they don't run away from each other, right? It's not rigid. And then fluid mechanics, 2005, 2006, where particles are not in any way tethered to each other. They just rub against each other, but they're just completely untethered. Get it? So in a way, the next six courses, W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, W6, all have to do with systems of particles. W03 and W04 kind of had to do with rigid bodies and particles. That's why I'm going to look at it. But in the end, they all give differential equations, so it doesn't matter. Just solve them, all right? So, so particles, systems of particles, rigid bodies. Now, then we introduce this other formulation called Lagrangian formulation, right? You may have noticed that in that, and you'll see this more and more, that there are two ways to solve dynamics problems from your physics classes. The Newtonian approach and then just using energy, energy stuff. And it's like this, boom, something happens and the problem gets solved, right? Energy is conserved. Wow, I have an equation, I solve it. And you, you might have wondered, what's the relationship? Well, they give the same answer, right? But energy is only one equation. And it turns out the Lagrangian method is kind of an energy-based indirect approach which lets you solve really complex problems in a very easy way, okay? But it's not as intuitive. So once you get dynamics, the Newtonian, the direct way, then we'll do Lagrangian. Now, all, all this, all the way through Lagrangian, the whole point of all this is to generate differential equations of motion. Is F, is, is F is equal to MA a differential equation? Yes. F is equal to M times D X double dot by DT squared, right? DT2, right? That's a differential equation. So we're going to generate differential equations. F is equal to MA seems like an easy differential equation, but when you see some of the acceleration terms we came up with, F is equal to MA can be a really complicated differential equation, right? To imagine the particle on the Frisbee, multiply that by M and equate that to F, right? And now let's say I tell you F is equal to some funky function, right? And I say solve for the path of the particle. That's a really complicated differential equation. So you're going to have to solve it. It happens to be nonlinear, et cetera, et cetera. It's really complicated, right? Uh, they can even be partial differential equations. You know, it can be complicated. But it turns out a large class of differential equations can actually be solved in a very intuitive and a completely mathematically correct way or simplified. And you can get some great intuition out of it. And we will do that here in that last section. And then um, you go on to 2W4, where the whole point of 2W4 is to analyze this in great detail, this piece. Because the whole point of what we're trying to do is figure out how stuff behaves under the influence of constitutive relationships and Newton's laws. OK, so that's the course. Now, on the kinematic side, the way we're going to do it is uh, it, the traditional way is this way, zigzag, zigzag, right? I don't like that. I want to take kinematics and just beat it to the ground, right? So we're going to go, in fact, we already have gone boom, all the way down. OK, everything you did with frames applies completely to rigid bodies. It's, you've done it. You're done, guys. You, you know, you've understood kinematics in a very complete way. There's only one piece we need to complete. We've concentrated so far on velocities and accelerations, right? You found the velocities and accelerations of points. And you, trust me, you know this better than any other undergraduate on the planet. Trust me, I really mean that, because no undergraduate stud in, in mechanical engineering, no undergraduate a course, curriculum covers it as completely as we did. And you have to admit, it was fairly straightforward, right? 
It was complicated, but it wasn't complex, right? It wasn't like some fundamental. You know, most concepts, in my opinion, you can break them down into a lot of simple steps. And we've done that. You should be in good shape for that. Today, I'm going to finish that. I'm going to do a Spidey problem again. And then we'll get into configurations. And it's just a few words, right? And if you're done with that, then today I'll get into, we'll be done with all this. All this will be done. 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 Check. Right? And then we'll get into kinetics of particles. And then what we'll do is kind of go like this. Okay? And we'll, you know, we will make a little bit of a you know, digression back into kinematics, but you'll use it a lot. And this kinematics also becomes very useful in here. Um, let me give you a, you can forget I said this if you're not interested, but the Newtonian approach is all about F is equal to MA. So you need to calculate accelerations. Lagrangian approach is based on energies, potential energy and kinetic energy. There's no acceleration involved. Kinetic energy has a velocity term. There's no acceleration term. Get it? So you still have to calculate the velocities, but you don't have to diddle with energies. Right? Kinetic energy, half mv squared. So as long as you have the velocity in square, you have an energy. You'll never have to calculate accelerations. That's why it's a little more convenient. We'll see that. But you also need kinematics because you still need to get to velocity. Okay? Any questions? And please don't do that at home, that whole, you know, the burning thing. So. Actually, I nearly set fire to my office. When I was a new professor here, I bought myself. At that time, that was before we had uh, these uh, LCD projectors. So I was very proud. I bought myself a little portable one of these things. You know, I'd have slides. I'd go present them. Went to my first presentation, set it up. You know, stared contemptuously at the crowd because they all had these old clunky things and set fire to my projector. So. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> By the way, on, from a reading point of view, we're still on uh, um, uh, in the same on the same chapter on kinematics in the textbook and on on my notes. When we start particles, I will recommend a new chapter, which is chapter four, section two, from Professor Williams's book that you should read. But we're not there yet. So when we get there, I'll tell you about it. So reading-wise, I, I do strongly recommend you read that book because the book is a little more traditional. It bridges us with the rest of the world in terms of how they talk, right, in their um, less sophisticated way. You need to speak them like that, right? You need to deal with the rest of the world still. Okay, so um, one of the things I'm going to do is just use, beat the same, you know, you'll see this often. I'll take the same problem, just do it again and again and again in different ways. So you'll see continuity, and hopefully you'll appreciate what you're learning. But what I want to do now is just, uh, again, that spider on the Frisbee th thing, and do it one last time. A is the frame of the Earth. The Frisbee is B, right? Spider is somewhere here, some distance L. And this angle is theta, right? B1 and B2 are lying this way. We call this V. We call this U. And the super, ultra, incredible magic formula was The acceleration, oh, we call this point Q. This point P, and this point O, bless you. Okay, you should be used to this problem. I've seen it a bunch of times. So, the super ultra cool pro formula was A, the velocity of point Q was what? Actually, yeah, it's probably, we start with this, right? Point P, and then, yeah. Okay. 
plus. How do you say omega? No, A omega B. Sorry, I meant. Right. Yeah, correct. A. Right? The super ultra um, cool formula, right? Actually, there are two versions the velocity version, the acceleration version. We derive them both. You remember that. Okay? In the Newtonian approach, we, we will be using this guy more. But keep in mind, when we get back to, when we get to Lagrangian and do energies, you'll need that. So don't forget it. It's a lesser cousin. Yep. What's your name? Kylie. Kylie, that's right. Yeah. Where is frame? Oh, B is the frame. This is the frame, right? So let's, let's say it again, right? Um, AVP is the velocity of some point on the Frisbee. In fact, this point with respect to frame O. BVQ is now you're sitting on the Frisbee. So to you, the Frisbee is stationary, right? And you see the velocity of the spider in some direction with respect to you. Like you're on a spaceship, as far as you're, the, as far as you're concerned, the spaceship is stationary. <coughs> Your colleague is heading off in some direction. So you know what that velocity vector is, and you know how far this colleague is from you as a vector. That's RPQ. Got it? Very important. And then A omega B is the angular velocity of the Frisbee or the spaceship. And RPQ is that distance again. It's correct? Is this correct? I make typos. Is this right? Is there a typo? Ajay? No typos? Okay. Now tell me what this is. Please. I'm sorry? You'll see five terms total. Yep. Yes. Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a typo. Thank you. This is incorrect. Oh, uh, sorry. This, yeah. This is, this is, yeah. Sorry. I don't know what you're saying. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Okay. The, this should be, what have I written? Oh, I see. It should be VQ. Right. Sorry. Sorry. When you have your nose to the blackboard, it's, it's hard to see what's going on. OK. So this is the complete formula. Now let's use it to solve the spider and the Frisbee problem one last time, one last hurrah. OK. So let's do that. So the. We're going to, I, I'm going to, okay, let's do velocity first. So A, velocity of the spider is equal to, what is AVP? Anything else? A 
Are there any other terms? Come on, guys, wake up. Come on, come on, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. You were right, but I want others to say it. So what's the next term? Come on. <laughs> what? Someone back there. Someone in perhaps a stripy shirt. Thank you. Yes, I just, you know, I know you know it. You just need to say it. Next term. Hmm? Anyone in a red t-shirt? Anyone? How about yourself? Well, it's a red jersey, I guess. Well, red sweater. Okay, go ahead. Anyone else? I don't want a cold call. It's too early. <coughs> Come on. Okay, someone back there. Anyone back there? Sam? Anyone? <laughs> Wake up. Yeah, it's this term, and that is theta dot d3, right? Yes? Cross L B1. Is that correct? And that compress converts to Done, right? It's obviously it was much simpler than earlier because we used all, our, all the tricks in our bag here. Okay. What is A acceleration of Q? Yeah. U double dot A1 plus V double dot A2 plus what? I'm going to raise this. Let's write it. You're going to have to, uh, okay, that's better. Because you're going to look at that and tell me, right? Plus what? Come on. Thank you. <laughs> Plus? Okay, we'll write, let's write it out. Let's, you know, and then we'll expand it in a minute. We'll, we'll calculate it in a minute. So what, what is it? It's 2 theta dot B3 cross L dot B1, right? What's that? Theta double dot B3 cross LB1. And this one? Theta dot, oh yeah, theta dot, I'm sorry. Theta dot B3. And then we'll finish it up here. Actually, I'm going to finish it up here, only because I don't care about this result particularly. We've done it a hundred times, three times now. So that comes out to be well, this term the same, same, same. This term is what? Two theta dot B two. This is and this is just expand, just do it all for me and tell me. And in, uh, let's think about it. Intuitively, it's centripetal, right? Centripetal towards the center. So it should be minus B1, right? So it should be minus B1. And it's omega squared r, basically, right, in our earlier terminology. So it's theta dot squared L. Done. Thank you. Just for aesthetic completeness, let me just write this down.
Much easier, right? But you've nailed it now. You totally understand how to calculate the acceleration, the velocity and acceleration of a point in the x and y direction, or in, the, in, in, in some basis, right, functions. Totally calculated. You're done. You really get this. This is awesome. Okay, remember, this is 200 years of evolution here, physics. Um, just a couple of notes. Ajay asked me to point out to you that in an exam or in a homework, if we ask you to do things in closed form, we don't give you numbers. Even if we give you numbers, it's okay to leave the B1s and B2s in. It's okay. That's the whole point of this, right? Now, when you're simulating it, let's say you're trying to solve the math problem, yeah, you'll probably want to convert everything to A1s and A2s, but, you know, it's fine. We don't want to burden you with all the unnecessary math, so that's fine. Okay? So you can leave, you know, A1 terms mixed with A1, A2 terms mixed with B1, B2. I want to emphasize again, everything we've said so far works totally in 3D as well, completely. That formula works in 3D as long as you define the angular velocities correctly. Okay. We did it three ways. We did the uh, first one was the kind of the completely general way. That works completely in 3D, even regardless of angular velocities, because we didn't, we didn't invoke an angular velocity. The magic formula works because you recognized an angular velocity, you took advantage of it to take derivatives, right? The super ultra magic formula is kind of a compression based on that for a specific situation. As long as you apply the situation right, everything is completely 3D. Any questions about this before we uh, wave it goodbye? Yep, Ted? Say it again? Oh, uh, can, the, the this one? No, you can't, because a omega b is a vector, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, you could do that. You could, you could do that. I mean, you, so what, what Ted is asking is, hey, can I write this as a omega b magnitude squared L? Yeah, that's the magnitude of it. Correct. So absolutely, right? But, you know, don't think of it in those terms. Just write it in vector form, right? Because you usually care about the net acceleration. And you're going to have to take the magnitude of the whole thing anyway. So think vector. Okay? Think pointy things. All right? Any other questions? I'm sure someone has some question lurking. Yeah, with you. Can you explain why when you differentiate Yeah, I... I the reason is very simple. Differentiation is trying to figure out how much it changes, right? Now, if I say what is the length of an acorn or something, <laughs> um, let's say I take something in space, right? I say what's the length, and it hasn't changed. The length, length hasn't changed the same, right? But with a vector, if the angle changes, then the difference is this kind of little angle, which is at 90 degrees, which is why we need to take the omega cross stuff, right? Scalars don't care. It's just a scalar. You know, it doesn't care what orientation it is, right? It's just a number. Get it? You know, it doesn't care what frame you're looking at it, unless you look at relativity or something, you know, which we don't do, right? The length is the length is the length. It doesn't matter where you look at it from. If the length is changing, it changes the same amount in terms of length, right? Regardless which frame. But the angle, you know, when you look at vectors, that angle thing comes into the picture. Okay? Any other questions? And the math works itself out, right? Um, a d by dt of b1. We're saying, hey, b1 is not constant in A. Express it in terms of a1 and a2. And bingo, everything works itself out, because a1 and a2 are constant in a1, in A. Right? Any other questions? That was a deep question, by the way. Any other questions about life, mechanical engineering? Pursuit of happiness? No? Okay. I mean, I wouldn't know the answer. I'll make something up. Okay. So now what we're going to do is get into something a little more interesting and different, uh, but a little more hand-wavy, but I'm going, to I'm going to now firm it up. I've been hand-waving my way through this because I wanted to give you the concept, but now we'll firm it up. So what we're talking, going to talk about right now is configurations.
Okay. Okay. Let us say, forget, forget dynamics. Let's say I give you three variables, three unknowns, and I give you two equations. Can you solve for the unknowns? Yes or no? No, you can't. If I give you three equations and I give you two unknowns, what's that called? Hmm? It's an overdetermined system, right? So either the third equation is basically the first two equations rewritten, right? Or something's got to give. By the way, in 2001, that giving is called bending, right? Think about it. If I have a beam and I say, hey, it can't be, you know, this point's got to be here. And I say, this point's got to be here. That's two equations, right? If I add a third equation, which is this point's got to be down there, my hand's got to bend, right? So it's an over-constrained system or an over-determined. If it's under-determined, you can't really solve it, okay? By the way, fluid mechanics deals with under-constrained under -constrained systems, okay? Now, what does solving mean? I want to get into that a little bit, and so that's what we're going to talk about now, you know, equations, unknown, stuff like that, okay? Let's look at our uh, spider situation here. How many degrees of freedom does the um, Frisbee have in two-dimensional space? From here on, when I said degrees of freedom, I'll say two-dimensional space. How many degrees of freedom does it have in two-dimensional space? That's Frisbee. Three. Okay, how many degrees of freedom does the spider have? It's a point, treat it as a point. How many degrees of freedom does the frisbee and do the frisbee and the spider have in total, in total? In order for me to specify exactly where the frisbee is, what position it is in, and where the fire spider is, how many parameters do I need? Let's say in the, it, um, in some, that's a good question. In some ways, it kind of doesn't matter, but let's assume it's the Earth. Actually, it's a deep question. I'll come back to that. Let's say in the, in the reference frame of the Earth. Good question. Okay? In the reference frame of the Earth, how many degrees of freedom do I need, uh, does, this, does this whole system have? If I want to, you know, if I'm trying to animate this, how many numbers do I need to tell you? where the spider and the frisbee are together. Think about it for a second, it's not that obvious. Is it four? But isn't three plus two five these days? I think they updated the math on that, I think. I'm kidding, yeah, it is. There's something wrong there, right? It, I want you to struggle with this for a second. Claudio. Isn't there a difference between degrees of freedom of the spider in reference to the air and in reference just to the frisbee? I mean, in terms of the frisbee, it's just walking up and down, right? So if you know where every point in the frisbee is, which is three degrees of freedom, you only need one for the spider. Yeah, you put your finger on it, and we'll come back to it. You're exactly right. But let me put it here differently. Let me confuse everyone a little bit. Okay, let me give you a fake counter argument, which is the spider has two degrees of freedom. Right? It can move in the x direction, it can move in the y direction. It's two. The frisbee has three degrees of freedom. That's five. So, how many degrees of freedom does this problem have? So, I've kind of, you know, I'm doing a little bit of hand, you know, a little bit of prestidigitation, you know, hiding something behind my back here. What do you think? Yep. That's exactly right. So, okay, let me explain. By rights, this system actually has 
5 degrees of freedom. But we did some, we made an assumption. Okay, by rights, the frisbee can be wherever the heck it chooses, the spider can be wherever the heck it chooses. But we made one assumption, which was the spider can only walk in a straight line away from the center of the frisbee. Okay? Remember? I didn't say the spider can go off to the left or to the right, or, you know, I just said it's walking away from, I said it repeatedly, and I made sure I said it. Right? But you didn't pick up on it, obviously, because I, you didn't know I was going to ask you this question. But I said the spider can only be on a straight line and walk in a straight line from the center of the frisbee. So, in fact, unbeknownst to you, I introduced a kinematic constraint. Which is, and the kinematic constraint I introduced, I'll write it in a minute, reduced it to four degrees of freedom. Okay? And the kinematic constraint I, I took was, I could have created a theta 2, which is not the theta 1 between, you know, that theta between B1 and B2 and A1 and A2. I could, I could have created a theta 2, which is the position of the spider. So the spider could have not walked in a straight line, but, you know, wandered off in some bizarre, you know, instead of, give, instead of locating the spider with just an L, I could have had a, like a, um, an M and an N to find the coordinates of the spider with respect to the frisbee. Get it? But I said, no, it cannot walk in the kind of the B2 direction. It can only walk in the B1 direction, right? So I introduced the constraint that it's wandering in the B2 direction is zero, right? And so in doing so, I implicitly introduced a kinematic constraint. I never spelled it out because we wrote the configuration of this entire system implicitly assuming that. So the kinematic constraint got sucked in implicitly. Get it? Right? In fact, in going from three dimension to, to two dimensions, there were some kinematic constraints there too. I said Z motion is zero, right? And I just very glibly call it two dimensions, but those are also kinematic constraints. And I took off for the frisbee, three degrees of freedom, and for the point, one degree of freedom, right? In even saying that, so in fact, those are kinematic constraints too. Very important that you understand this. What I'm trying to say to you is that part and parcel in a lot of what we do is this concept of a kinematic constraint. Okay? And it's very central to us because sometimes we'll say it, sometimes we won't. Sometimes it's so implicit that we'll just not account for it and we will pick the parameters in such a way that it automatically accounts for the kinematic constraint. Get it? And sometimes we'll write things in with more parameters than you need and then introduce a kinematic constraint, right? So help me here. How could I have redefined that Frisbee problem in more general terms? And by the way, the magic formula does not assume that the spider is only moving in a straight line from the center of the Frisbee. Remember, in the magic formula, right? This RPQ is pretty general. BVQ is pretty general. But when we wrote BVQ, we assume it was only LB1, right? It wasn't an L1, B1 plus an L2, B2. You see where the kinematic constraint slipped in, guys? It's very important that you get this. I want to see everyone nodding or disagreeing. Very important, okay? If we had done that, it would have been five degrees of freedom. Thanks. Right? In this, there are actually five parameters. But in the instantiation of the Frisbee problem, there were only four parameters, and those four parameters were u, v, theta, and l. Get it? Very important. Okay. So, I will now, what I'm going to do, now, okay, now you have four unknowns in this, right? 
we want to solve for the trajectory and find out these unknowns, right? That's what dynamics is about. How many equations do you need? Four. And let me now give you a kind of a heads up into where dynamics is going to lead. We have four unknowns. Um, U dot, U, now, right? V, L, and theta. We have four unknowns. And we want four equations. Right? So when you do dynamics, you will get four equations relating this to you know, various forces and masses. You will get four equations. This is just a heads up. Okay? The only difference is that unlike in algebraic equations, where you have only u, in our equations, you'll have u, u dot, and u double dot, v, v dot, and v double dot, l, l dot, and l double dot. Theta, theta dot, and theta double dot. You know, because you're going to take an acceleration and say f is equal to ma, for example, right? There'll be theta double dot terms. So you'll get four differential equations to solve the problem. Or, you know, some of the equations might simplify, but in general, you'll get four differential equations. Get it? So you'll have as many unknowns as the equations, and it is our goal to generate as many unknowns as there are equations and solve it. And when we solve it, we solve the differential equation, you'll get x as a function of time, and that's the trajectory of the system. So the objective of dynamics at some level is to formulate enough equations, as many equations as you need, which is, usually, which is always equal to the number of unknowns, right? Solve them, and get theta as a function of time. The equations themselves will be differential equations instead of u, u, in terms of u, u dot, u double dot, right? In the algebraic world, you would just have this stuff. And you would solve for u, v, dub, l, and theta. But in dynamics, you solve for u as a function of time, get it? such that the differential equation is satisfied. Do you get a sense of where we're going with this? Yes, no, yes, maybe a little bit. Okay, we haven't done dynamics yet. By the time we're done with all this, you'll see it. Okay. Let's, uh, you know, we have a couple of minutes and we're going a little ahead in the class, so it's, it's good to discuss. So let's take a step back. Let's look ahead into this class and recall your physics. Right? We have a particle that's moving. We have a frisbee that's moving. What equations can you write for a frisbee in two dimensions? F is equal to ma. How many, what equations can you write for a rigid body, equating forces and force-like things to motion and accelerations? Let's start with the particle. Anybody? Let me get you going here. Okay, this is we're just discussing. This is just nothing formal, okay? So let your head down, just get out, you know, relax. Okay. You can write this for the particle, right? Assuming for let's say for example the particle has some, you know, glue, right? Or the feet have some adhesion and it's walking the frisbee, and you know what the force is, you can write this, right? How many equations is that in two dimensions? Two. Two, uh, two, two equations in two dimensions. For the Frisbee, you can also write F is equal to MA. You'll see this in the la later. You take the central mass and equate F is equal to MA. How many equations will you get? Two. two. Right. And finally, what's the last equation you'll get? Torque is equal to I alpha, right? In general, there are five degrees of freedom in this problem, right? In the special case, there'll be four, and you'll see one of the equations will go away, and you'll get four degrees of freedom. Four equations, you write four differential equations, solve them, and you can solve for four trajectories, okay? And when you're done, you know, if you, for example, let's say the Frisbee, I threw it, right, and it's being dragged by air, so it's slowing down, and it's, forget gravity because it's two dimensions, right? And let us say, I know how much power the spider's little legs are applying, so I know how much force it's applying, right? Once you solve all these differential equations, if I give you the forces and I tell you what the drag is, you should be able to come up with the trajectory of the spider, and it'll look like something like this, right? If this is the A1 direction, and this is the A2 direction, 
you know, if I throw the frisbee and the spider is kind of running away from the center, it will probably look something like this, right? It's kind of this outward bound spiral. And that's kind of what we're trying to solve for. And the way you capture this is you're solving for uh, the position of the spider. You're trying to solve for R, O, Q as a function of time. Right? If you solve for that, boom, you know exactly where the spider is. Okay? If you solve for R, O, P as a function of time, what am I solving for? The center of the frisbee, which is kind of going to go look like this with time, different instants in time. Right? Think of it as animation. Right? And if I solve for R, P, Q as a function of time, what am I solving for? Say it again. Yeah. Now I'm actually sitting on the frisbee. Right? Sitting on the frisbee. And so that's me. And I'm looking out. To me, the frisbee isn't rotating. Right? I just see the spider kind of walking away. Right? But I know that the spider is feeling all these forces. Right? Spider doesn't know stuff is rotating. Like, just like we don't feel the earth rotating. Right? Spider is feeling this kind of, you know, being heaved by, you know, um, Coriolis forces, centripetal forces, all that stuff. It's kind of, you know, making its way through. Right? And you can see what that is. Get it? This is kind of what we're shooting for here, folks. Okay? This is why we did velocities and accelerations, kind of the first step. Okay. So with that, I mean, I'm going to raise this and kind of define things more formally. And we call those numbers parameters. But I want to now say things maybe a little more formally. A mechanical, yep. Levi. I was I was hand waving a little bit, so but let me give you a hand wavy answer before I formalize it. Okay? Yeah. The differential equations will end up being something like position of the spider, right? Which is the, um, there'll be a vector, it'll be a vector differential equation. So it'll be some, some really complicated, in fact, I'm going to go into that right now. Some really complicated relationship between this, the mass of the spider, and the force on the spider. Okay? And in two dimensions, that's two equations. Okay? So hold that thought, Levi, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it more. Okay? Any other questions? This was meant to be hand wavy because I know we can't say it all now. I could kind of hold my breath and tell you in the end of the class. Or I could kind of take a stab at kind of giving you a sense of where we're going, right? And then hopefully things will become firm later, right? I don't like this business of keeping you in the dark and, you know, just kind of hoping things fall into place in the end, okay? So a mechanical system consisting of points and rigid bodies Okay. Has in general infinite possible Okay? The frisbee and the point, there are infinite possible locations, right? Each arrangement is called a configuration. Okay? 
So if I told you the Frisbee is here in this orientation and the spider is three inches from the center, bam, I've frozen it. That's a configuration. Okay? Now, a little bit of history before I say, may I write the next sentence. It used to be that um, the way you located something was using Cartesian coordinates. What are Cartesian coordinates? X, Y, Z, right? That's, uh, you know, two meters north, three meters, you know, west, and, you know, two meters up, right? X, Y, Z. So that word coordinate might be ingrained in your brain as being, you know, Cartesian, X, Y, Z, right? But it turns out that that's not always the best way to, look, to define the location of the, you know, the configuration of something. For example, for the spider, did we use XYZ only? No. We used the um, X and Y, kind of U and V, but we used the angle of the, the Frisbee and the distance from the center. So it's kind of more like a polar coordinate, right? So we use some combination of coordinates, right? So the next sentence is, A set of parameters that define the, uh, sorry, a unique configuration of a system. is referred to as the non-standard, to emphasize that it's not Cartesian, non-standard coordinates of that system. And what are the non-standard coordinates of the system that we looked at here? They are U, V, L, and theta. They are not Cartesian coordinates. They are the non-standard coordinates of that system. Get it? So what we do in mechanical systems, and we did this in the Frisbee, but now you're going to do more formally from here on, is when you look at a system, you say, what are the parameters? I need to define exactly where this thing is, right? And I'm only, I don't mean just you know the thing, but everything that moves in it. And that set of coordinates, and it doesn't have to be Cartesian. It's a bunch of numbers that you would think work. That set of numbers is called the non-standard coordinates of that system. Get it? And we just say non-standard because Cartesian is really taken over the word coordinate. Okay. okay. And how many non-standard coordinates will you find in a system? It is equal to the degrees of freedom of that system. Okay. Can you have more non-standard coordinates than degrees of freedom? That's right. You can have more non-standard coordinates than there are degrees of freedom. It's okay. But then you better specify the kinematic constraint that makes one of them independent of the others. Get it? So the number of non-standard coordinates minus the number of degrees of freedom, minus the number of kinematic constraints must equal the degrees of freedom of that system. OK? So let me write that now in the next. So the next fact, so this was actually a definition. Fact.
very intuitive. You should understand this, right? OK? And how many equations of motion will you get? As many as there are degrees of freedom. That's kind of how we're going to build this, right? You can throw the, or you can just say you'll get as many equations, not equations of motions, as there are non-standard coordinates, but then you need as many differential equations as there are degrees of freedom and kinematic constraints as another set of equations. But this is the fundamental thing you're going to, you're going to be dealing with, OK? So I'm sure there are questions about this, but I'm going to go very slowly and I have another 20 minutes. I want to just totally nail this. I thought I'd get into point dynamics, but I knew I'd only kind of get into it today. So I don't mind starting that next Wednesday. Monday is a holiday, by the way. Or there's no class. It's not a holiday. Uh, so we'll get into point dynamics in the next class. But I'm going to spend a few minutes and just totally nail this. And then we're going to do some more kinematic constraints. Yep. I'm confused about this. Yeah. Sh shouldn't it be degrees of freedom minus the kinematic or constraints equal to non-standard points? Sure, that's true too, right? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Like, for example, the spider problem, we have four non-standard coordinates minus one kinematic constraint. No, but I just want to hold on a second. That would be the three years of freedom. It should be a plus there, or it should be kinematic constraint on the other side. Hold that thought. Good, good, good point. Let me just see. No, let me explain. Let me explain. OK? Good Good point, Claudia. Good. Thank you. This is how we probe and understand this. Anyone else confused about that? Huh? Claudia, why don't you stand up and say loudly what you just said? That was, and by the way, it's a perfectly reasonable statement. So I'm not great. Thank you. So say it again. So I'm confused as to why, why that's a kind of a minus there. Because if you have, for example, in the spider problem, four non standard coordinates. Minus the one kinematic constraint that would give you three degrees of freedom, and we agree we had five degrees of freedom without the constraint or four with the constraint. So I thought maybe it should be the minus kinematic constraint on the okay. right. So let's 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 look at that. Okay, I'm gonna write the DOF here. Very good. I have to tell you, 20 years you know after studying for this for the first time. I still have to prepare for this class, OK? So this is, you know, it's, it's fairly profound stuff. So you need to think about it. Once you get it, it's really cool. It falls back into place. So essentially, I wake up in the morning and go, and I drink a lot of coffee, and I think about it at pace, right? And it all falls back into place. So that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Here, let me explain. Actually, you set up what I was going to do anyway very well. I could have set up the Frisbee problem in two ways, OK? I could have said, here's the Frisbee. I need its, this is in two dimensions, right? And let's say that, you know, starting here, I'm trying to draw it in three dimensions here, right? I need its location in terms of u and v, right? And I could have said, listen, that, you know, our friend Spidey here could be in any location. It's probably wandering, you know, generally, right? So I need u and v and some m and n with respect to the frisbee of the spider, and I need the angle of the, fris of the spider, right? I'm sorry, our angle of the frisbee. That is five non-standard coordinates to describe the configuration of the system, OK? Five. Yes? Five, right? Three for the fris frisbee, two for the spider. And then I could say, but guys, you know what I'm going to do? Spider, the spider, I'm not going to let him wander around. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a rail here, like this. OK? And then on the rail, by the way, this is called a linear guide in mechanical engineering. When Professor Slocum teaches you um, design, he will t tell you what a, a linear guide is. So it's like a track. So Spidey can just walk in any direction, right? The spider has to remain on this rail and can kind of, you know, paddle forward or paddle back. If I do that, I've introduced one constraint, which is n is always equal to 0, which is, you know, I call it m 
and and the kind of coordinates on the frisbee, and I'm saying that it can't move this way. Get it? So phi minus one is equal to four. Okay. Alternately, I could have picked, which is what I did in the class throughout. I could have just picked four non-standard coordinates, right? Which was I just assumed that the spider is completely specified by an L, a distance from the center. How many kinematic constraints do I need to explicitly list them? Get it? So it's good. I mean, I'm glad you asked me. I had to think about it for a second. But that's the key. Okay. And what we do is we will naturally take some kinematic constraints, and some will write out explicitly. You'll see that. Okay. And by the way, some kinematic constraints, it is impossible to kind of do it naturally. You have to express them explicitly. Um, and we won't look at systems like that. We look at systems where the kinematic constraint can be stated explicitly, but if you really tried, you can make them implicit. You understand? So good. So you understand what I'm saying here, right? Any questions, anybody? OK. And by the way, all we did in this class so far, all we've done, is take these non-standard coordinates. I want to introduce one more concept, then I'll do an example. We take these non-standard coordinates and calculate the accelerations of the points and rigid bodies, angular, vac angular accelerations, et cetera, in terms of the non-standard coordinates. Right? Look, look at this. The acceleration of point Q is U double dot, right? V double dot, theta double dot, theta dot, L, L dot, L double dot, right? So can, what we've done so far is express, we have expressed accelerations. This is, by the way, the short form from accelerations and velocities in terms of non standard coordinates. Got it? That's what we've done. And why are we doing it? Because when we write f is equal to ma, we have a, right, in terms of these non standard coordinates. We'll multiply it by m and equate it to an f, which will come from some constitutive relationship. And we have the differential equation. Got it? So this is the tough part. Now, I want to make one final comment to you. And this will only become important when we do Lagrangian. So the way we do Newtonian, which is what we're doing right now, is just be clear that they're non-standard coordinates, the kinematic constraints, and the degrees of freedom. When we do Lagrangian, as Claudio pointed out, there were many sets of non-standard coordinates I could have picked, right? And I could have chosen to inst introduce a kinematic constraint. When we do Lagrangian, you're also forced to pick the minimum number of non-standard coordinates. Get it? You're forced to. If you do that, it just math becomes really simple. In Newtonian, it kind of doesn't matter. Okay? So the thing that Claudio is pointing out, this minimum, actually, if you could do that, it's the best. In Newtonian, it doesn't matter. We're in the Newtonian phase right now. Okay? And there's a special word for it. I'll introduce it when we get there. Okay? By the way, there's one other concept that happens with these non standard coordinates, which is some non standard coordinates are more general than others. Does anybody understand that? Okay, maybe let me take it the opposite way. Some non-standard coordinates are more natural than others. You understand that? Let me explain. You don't. That's the whole point. Let me explain. So I stated the first frisbee problem as is a throwing it in space, right? Forget the spider. Just look at the frisbee. So the best way to describe its location was U and V, right? But what if I told you that it's the same thing mathematically? But really what I had was a robotic arm, which extends very rapidly. It's a telescoping robotic arm. And the end of it 
is a spinning disk, right? And the robotic arm can turn, and it can change in length. Would you still have picked U and V as the non-standard coordinates? What would you have picked? L1 and theta 1, right? It's because it's more natural. It reflects the mechanism a little more. And this is the difference between mechanical engineers and mathematicians, right? For you, you're trying to figure out how much should I change L1, you know? How much should I change the angle? So another concept here is one of And this is the hand wavy part where judgment comes in. But you know what I mean, right? It's pretty obvious you wouldn't use U1 and V1 in this situation. You would use L1 and theta 1, right? Everyone copacetic with this? Yes? So that's what I want to say about coordinates. <coughs> so we've covered three concepts here. We've covered the concepts of non-standard coordinates. We've covered the concept of kinematic constraints and degrees of freedom. And we've just covered the concept of naturalness, which is the fuzziest of all, but that's where your judgment comes in. Okay? And for example, if you wanted to accelerate, if you're trying to figure out, you know, I'm trying to design a hydraulic system to power this telescoping arm, what pressure does it need so I can buy the right compressor and I can size things properly, right? This is what you would solve. Well, then the question you would ask is, well, what's the mass at the end of this guy? Right? Well, so then I tell you, hey, the mass is, you know, two kilograms. Are you rotating this? Yes. Is it symmetric or is there a spider, a really heavy spider, or, you know, a metallic object running out? No, there is a spider running out. Oh, in that case, when I try and extend the arm, because of centripetal, all that stuff, there's going to be kind of a, you know, a vibration, right? Oh, that's right, I need to think of the vibration. That means the hydraulic system must exert enough force to overcome the maximum, plus the system must be able to handle the vibration. Get it? This is the sort of thinking, right? And this is what we do. By the way, do you know how a lot of cell phones, you know, the ones that buzz, you know, the vibrate? You know how they vibrate? Yeah, there's been a little eccentric thing, right? An eccentric mass, that's how they vibrate, right? So you can see how a rigid body can create vibration because you're spinning it. And that's why we balance our tires, too, by the way. Right? OK, so that's that. Now let me solve a problem. And I'm going to have you guys do this as a snack quiz, because this is a really cool problem that I, I had a simple problem in mind. But as I was giving the lecture, I thought of a more complex problem. And I thought, why not have them solve a snap quiz? So here's the problem, folks. Spider, our buddy the spider, right? Frisbee thrown. Frisbee spinning away. Spidey is running, right? Here's the complication. This particular Frisbee has a little pulley that's kind of attached to the Frisbee. It's not really a pulley. It's like a, a winding. It's, it's a little... Uh, Twine winder, I tie a string. So there's a lot of twine wound around this. So I'm actually tossing a ball of twine, get it? Attached to a Frisbee. And as this thing goes out, right, it unwinds the twine. And there's a lot of twines. You don't know why with the twine running out, OK? And I tell you that this radius is R1 
and I ask you to come up with, for the Frisbee problem, the four parameters, four uh, non-standard coordinates, right? Actually, you can ignore the spider if you want. Just look at the Frisbee itself. What is the kinematic constraint that I need to include? First of all, do you see that there's a kinematic constraint? Right? What two parameters does this kinematic constraint affect? Think about it. Or what three parameters? Think about it. Try and frame for me. I don't know the answer because I was going to give you a simpler problem. I thought it complicated because I felt like you were getting it. Right? So I thought I'd test your uh, metal a little better. The question is very simple. This is an extension to the Frisbee problem, right? Initially, you, uh, earlier, the problem was you're throwing a Frisbee. Now I'm telling you, yeah, you're doing the same thing, you're throwing a Frisbee, but there is this ball of twine of radius r that is going to unwind as the Frisbee goes away, and I proclaim, I claim, I assert that there is a kinematic constraint that is created by that. The R1 is constant, yeah. So are we, are we finding the Write out the kinematic constraint for me. That's it. You can approximate it if you'd like. A kinematic constraint is an equation relating some of the non-standard parameters with others, right? You are trying, so I, I described to you in English, right, this problem, and I'm saying, hey, you know, the fact that there's a string, it's gonna constrain this Frisbee, right? And I'm saying, give me an equation that captures the fact that this Frisbee is somehow constrained. Uh, what we have done so far is list, and that's all, that's all I can say, otherwise I'm solving the problem for you. We've listed some non-standard parameters. We listed four, right? We've introduced, introduced a kinematic constraint. So there's the four, some of the non-standard parameters are going to be related to the others. They won't be independent anymore. And I want you to struggle with this, because if you're not able to convert what I said in English to the equation, that's okay. That's part of why I'm asking you to do this. Because if you struggle through it once, you'll get it. Okay, we're running out of time, so let me do it for you, okay? Here's the deal. And a couple of you got it, I think. Uh, and you can kind of self-judge whether you got it, but do turn these things in. Very simple, guys. What's going to happen to the Frisbee as it traverses space under this new circumstance, which is this twine unwinding? <laughs> Someone? Yep. Um, well, I made L be the length of the string, and then said that L squared equals U squared plus U squared. Uh, right. So uh, is that what you wrote as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah, part of it. OK. So that's one way to, well, let me. Okay, that's that's okay. So okay, okay. Hold, what's your name again? Connie. Connie. So that's right. So, so when this frisbee flies, it unwinds, right? What is the constraint that happens when it unwinds? Uh, Say it again. By R theta. That's right. So he, what it means is that it can't spin randomly. The spins, it's kind of un, unrolling, right? Do you see what I mean, Connie? Right. So you could say something like. This distance is almost exactly equal to, actually, I need to take some geometry corrections. There's more, some small corrections, right? Because it's really not this distance, but it's this distance. But assume the thing is small. That distance, let's call this, it, that distance is u squared plus v squared square root, right? In the uv terminology, right? Is equal to. Uh, sorry, that distance multiplied by, by theta. I said that wrong. R theta. 
Get it? Very simple, Sam. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm, that's, that's a correction, but for if the radius is small, right, I don't, yes. Why? Because remember, let's say that the L is constant. It'll just go around a circle. So this angle is irrelevant. This angle, theta, is irrelevant, right? Theta 2, we call it theta 2 in my alternate formulation. This angle is irrelevant. Yes. Yes. It's actually minus theta 2, right, Ajay? Yeah, so it's right. No, no, you're exactly right. By the way, you caught me. And actually, Ted, you kind of missed that, right? And Claudia, I don't know if you got that. Some of you, thank you, Sam, brilliant. Actually, that's thank you, right? I took theta, so I need to write this properly. I'll tell you what, I'll solve it for you and you'll get it, right? I'll, I'll, I made up the problem on the fly, but we'll solve it for you and get, and get it to you. We call this theta, right? If, in fact, the frisbee is kind of rotating that way, right? In other words, if this angle changes and we call this theta 1, then there is actually, it'll be, that's what it'll come out to be. It's actually exactly correct. You're exactly correct. OK? So if you don't get this, don't worry. By the way, there's the other way to say this is that if we had picked coordinates L1 and theta1, then this would simply have become L1. Right? By the way, this theta1 in the UV, it should really be the inverse tan of v over u. OK? R is this. Oh, R is the radius of this little twine thing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, that's correct. We'll, we'll correct that. OK. In this case, I just wrote it like that. If it didn't, there'd be some constant amount. Okay, right. So yeah, it'll just be a constant number, and yeah, I would add that. OK? Guys, I did this fast, OK? I, want, I should probably have done the simpler example. I kind of innovated here. But actually, this example turns out to be much more pretty than I expected. The hidden depth stood. Ajay, is this actually non holonomic? We'll think about it. It may not be. But it, it, might, it has some hidden depths to it. But, you, uh, but before you go, do you kind of get, get what I'm saying here? It's a kinematic constraint. It's an additional constraint. That means if you know L, you don't need theta. If you know theta, you don't need L, right? They are not independent of each other. But we've kind of captured it as a constraint. Now, as it turns out, writing this constraint is a little more complicated than I kind of thought I was doing the lecture. So we'll write it out for you completely. And I'll give you a handout on Wednesday, OK? The homework is due next Wednesday in the morning. See you next week. <laughs>